out this week. So Charles Deck is stepping up as the deacon chairman. He's going to be reading from the book of Luke in chapter 22, verses 55 through 61, and then he's going to pray a prayer of invocation. Good morning, church. Good morning. We'd ask you to please stand for the reading of God's Word. Be in Luke 22, verses 55 through 61. The guards lit a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat around it. And Peter joined them there. A servant girl noticed him in the firelight and began staring at him. Finally, she said, this man was one of Jesus' followers. But Peter denied it. Woman, he said, I don't even know him. After a while, someone else looked at him and said, you must be one of them. No, man, I'm not, Peter retorted. About an hour later, someone else insisted, this must be one of them, because he is a Galilean too. But Peter said, man, I don't know what you're talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. At that moment, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Suddenly, the Lord's words flashed through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny three times that I even know me. You may be seated. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word, your truth. Father, we ask that we open our minds and our hearts to your message today. Be with Chris as he brings the word to us and help us to receive your truth of your word. Father, may your spirit move through this place and touch the hearts that need to be touched. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord and hallelujah. All right, the Apostle Peter, he was introduced by his brother Andrew to Jesus Christ. Peter walked with Jesus the three some years that Jesus walked the earth in his ministry. Peter was considered the leader of the apostles. He kind of took charge and took over. If you've been watching The Chosen, you see that kind of played out as they go through the seasons, but Peter was a head. he was impetuous, he stuck his foot in his mouth, and they could have changed that name to Chris Woody as far as all that's concerned, because I do the same thing. Peter, who followed Jesus, who told Jesus, if you're going to die, I'll die right beside you. If they're going to take you, they're going to take me too. Soon as things got a little bit hot, Jesus going through the kangaroo courts, getting ready to get hung on a cross and beaten. What does Peter do? He doesn't stand up and bow up and say, Jesus, I'm right here. He says, I don't know who that guy is. Why are you pointing at me? I don't know him. And folks, if you're honest with yourself, at some point in your life, you have done that very same thing. You have. You have to be honest now. We've all done it, but we see that Peter, his real name was Simon, but Jesus changed his name. Now, we get the English word Peter from uh, uh, the uh, Greek word Petros. And so, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and one of the three named pillars of the early church in Jerusalem... Peter was the first Christian missionary to the Gentiles. Now, I know this may come up as a question tonight when we meet in the fellowship hall and everybody says, but pastor, didn't you say that Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles? Yes, I did, and I'll stick by that. He was the apostle to the Gentiles, but Peter was instrumental in getting the gospel to the Gentile world. He did it kind of by mistake. He didn't intentionally go and do this. They overheard him preaching to a crowd. But then when he got back to Jerusalem, some of the other apostles said, what are you doing talking to those dirty Gentiles? But Peter knew his calling. But what I want to walk you through today is through some of Peter's failure and then his being uh, uh, restored. And so we all can take some uh, comfort in the fact that Jesus, by all means, could have looked at Peter and said, you know what, you've denied me three times, I'm done with you. 
but he didn't. But there is a real warning in Scripture, and I want you all to be aware of this. In Romans chapter 1, we find that God will eventually lose patience with some people. If you deny Him long enough, He's going to give you over to a reprobate mind. And you'll no longer be called. But that's, that's a warning. If you're here today and, and you're not a Christian, you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have one more opportunity. So pay heed what we learn here. Now, we, uh, we find that in one of the early scriptures that Jesus changes Simon's name to Peter, but I want you to understand that my clicker's not working. Can we fix that up there in the booth? Yeah, I hope you got a fill in the blank sheet. If they get that running, I'll, uh, I'll start using it again. But number one on your fill in the blank sheet, Yep, we see that Peter didn't always live up to his name. Because Peter was the rock. Solid foundation. Jesus wanted him to be the solid foundation for the other apostles. Because Jesus knew what was going to happen before the book of Acts was written. Jesus knew what was going to happen 2,000 years later. Jesus knows what's going to happen 1,000 years from now. Jesus already knew that Peter was going to deny him. Jesus even called it out to him before it ever happened. But we see the account in Matthew 16, 18. Now, if you're familiar with this gospel, Jesus had been asking the apostles, who do the people say that I am? And they were saying, well, some uh, say that you're Elijah. Some say you're this, some say you're Well, who do you say that I am? And Peter answers him, and he says, You're the Son of God, you're the Christ, you're the Messiah. And Jesus said, You have answered well. And then he says in verse 18, And also I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. So, I've heard it explained and I've read the Greek words and I know Jesus has a couple of different meanings here. One, he says, you are Petros and on this Petra I will build my church. He's saying you're the little rock but on this big rock. He's talking about the confession that Peter had just made. But I want you to understand, there can be another meaning here. Loud, angry, impetuous Peter. Jesus was going to use to build His church. An imperfect person, God was going to use to save people of this world. You, imperfect person sitting, listening to this message, God wants to use you to build the church. You need to take heed. You need to listen. So we'll see that Jesus has a couple of meanings by this statement. But they have to go through some issues first before they get to that point. You see, Jesus knew the whole time that He was going to be arrested. He was going to be tried in a court that was illegal. He was going to be found guilty of something that He was not guilty of. And He was going to die a horrible death carrying the sins of the world on his shoulders in order that the creation might be saved. So he is slowly letting the apostles know that these things are going to happen. And Peter didn't like that he said that. So what did Jesus do? Jesus also called Peter Satan. Could you imagine... Jesus Christ calling you Satan. Now, I want you to understand, Satan is not a proper name for the devil. Satan actually describes an attribute of the devil, a deceiver. Satan is a liar. So, Jesus isn't looking at Peter and saying, you are the fallen angel that God created. He's saying, you're being a liar and a deceiver and you need to stop it. So in Mark chapter 8, verses 32 and 33, Jesus spoke openly about him 
being crucified, killed for the sins of the world. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, but turning around and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are not thinking about God's concerns, but human concerns. Lord, haven't we all been there? We're not concerned about the good of the church. We're concerned about the good of me. We're not concerned about lost people in the neighborhood. We're concerned that my Saturday's going to get messed up. We're not concerned about folks that are seeking the Lord. We're concerned about me being embarrassed or having to study something so I can present it in a way that they would understand. See, we're selfish people. We all are. And we have to make that conscious decision that we're going to do the will of God. It doesn't come naturally. You have to work at it. Now, as you grow in Christ, as you do it, more and more, it does start to become natural to you, but nobody starts off being a great apologist or an evangelist. It just doesn't work that way. It takes years of witnessing to people to get comfortable enough to do it that they can start understanding. But I tell you, one of the greatest things that God does, He takes a, a young, freshly saved, uh, ball-headed boy from West Virginia, sticks him with an evangelist, and they go out knocking on doors in the Goose Creek area. And while I'm trying to present the gospel, it's uh, 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 and can't get my words out right. And lo and behold, that guy with tears in his eyes says, can I pray to accept Jesus? He uses your imperfect words, your stammering, your stuttering. God can use that. But He can't use it if you're sitting at home. You have to take it out to the streets. So Peter got under Jesus' skin. Well, Jesus, you don't need to go to the cross. Jesus, you don't need to die. You don't need... You know what? Quit worrying about what's going to happen to you when I leave. You worry about what God wants to happen. That's what Jesus is telling Peter here. But that wasn't the only account that Jesus got upset at Peter because you see, number three, Peter wasn't always obedient to Jesus. I didn't even write down the account of the Mount of Transfiguration where Peter went up there and he got all fanboy and went crazy on Jesus wanting to build temples for three people up there on that mountain. And Jesus said, why don't you just calm down and enjoy the majesty that you see before you? Why don't you just see the glory of God for what it is? Quit worrying about building altars. Worry about sitting at the feet of Jesus and learning something. We don't need to worry about building up altars. You are an altar. The Holy Spirit lives in you. Take care of the altar that God has already given you. Quit worrying about building it up and, and looking more pious than someone else and just enjoy being in the light of Christ and serving Him with your whole heart. You don't have to be the best dressed. You don't have to be the best speaker. You just have to be obedient to God and allow Him to use you. And that's what God, or Jesus, God, Jesus wanted Peter to do. But when Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray, He told His apostles, y'all stay here and pray and wait on me. What did He find when He came back? Matthew 26, 40. When Jesus came back to the disciples, He found them sleeping. He asked Peter, why did he pick on Peter? Because Peter was the leader of the apostles. He said, so you couldn't even stay awake for one hour? You couldn't even stay awake to pray with me for one hour? Peter was also prone to violence. On that same night, when Judas came up and planted a kiss on Jesus' cheek so that the Roman guards would know who to take away, Old oh, impetuous Peter jumps into action. John 18, 10 and 11. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's servant, and cut off his right ear. 
The servant's name was Malchus. Do y'all ever wonder why they mention proper names in the Scriptures? This is a side note, and this one's free. Y'all don't have to pay me for this. They did it because this was written in the time of eyewitnesses, among other eyewitnesses, so if someone doubted this account, you know who they could go find? They could go find old Malchus and ask him. That's why you see proper names in the Scripture, because it bears witness to the truth of Scripture. You're not going to add someone's name if it's a lie, because someone can go check with that person, but that's why it's in there. At that, Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword away. Am I not to drink the cup the Father has given me? Peter, once again, wanted to save Jesus. Wanted to make sure Jesus didn't get into trouble. I'm so glad Peter failed at his mission to protect Jesus. Because folks, it was God's good pleasure for Jesus to hang on that cross of Calvary. It should be your good pleasure as well. Because of what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary, you don't have to take the eternal punishment for your sin. So we see that Peter, not only was he a loud mouth, not only did he stick his foot in his mouth, not only was he prone to violence, but Peter denies Jesus. <gasps> no way. Yes way. The man walked with Jesus on the earth. You just come to church on Sunday. He witnessed Jesus' miracles. You read about it and doubt it. He witnessed Jesus explaining to them that He had to go to the cross to be beaten and to die for the sins of the world. Peter witnessed these things. And yet he denied Jesus. Folks, this is such a big deal that this account makes it into all four Gospels. Not every miracle of Jesus makes it into all four Gospels. Not every account of their missionary journeys makes it into all four Gospels. The account of Peter denying Jesus is such a big deal that it was written about in all four Gospels. If the apostles wanted to perpetrate a fraud about Jesus, would they have been so quick to make themselves look bad? Peter looks like a moron in this story. He looks like a bad guy in this story. If I'm going to write the story of Chris Woody, I'm going to be the hero in my book. I'm going to have all my hair. I'm going to weigh 170 pounds. Ooh, who's right? I'm going to look good. But yet, the men that wrote the eyewitness accounts of being with Jesus went ahead and included all of their flaws. Further proof that this book is truth. Because a man's not going to write about himself to make him look bad. We could get into women finding the tomb empty, because back then a woman's testimony was worth how much, fellas? Nothing. Nothing. But yet they used the eyewitness account of females going to the tomb and finding it empty. If, if I was Luke or John or Mark, I would have written down, the ladies wanted to go to the tomb, but we said, no, 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 your place is in the home. Fix us breakfast while we go to the tomb. But they didn't do that. They wrote the truth. Why? Jesus knew 2,000 years later that someone would need to be convinced. This is one of the proofs we have for Scripture being true. But Jesus was getting ready to be beaten within an inch of His life and to hang on the cross. And Peter didn't want to be associated with Jesus because he was scared of persecution. Now, I'm going to stand here and I'm going to say 
if armed guards ever break into the church and say, you need to quit preaching the gospel or we're going to shoot your head off. Right now I can stand here and say, that will not stop me from preaching the gospel. But folks, when they come in with the bayonets and the swords and threatening to kill me, I might become a quivering mass of jello. I don't know until that time happens. I like to think that I have enough faith to say, you can't take my life. Jesus already has it. But Peter, who walked with Jesus, denied him because he was afraid. We all get afraid from time to time. We all, we all get ashamed when we're around friends and they're cutting up and carousing and telling their dirty jokes and wanting to go out and do ungodly things. We don't want to be the wet blanket. We don't want to be the bad guy. Be the bad guy. Be the wet blanket. Say, that doesn't honor God. I'm not going to do it. Be brave enough to at least do that much. I can't tell you how many parties I don't get invited to. Because I am a wet blanket. Oh, that doesn't honor God. I ain't doing it. I can't do it. But sadly, Peter denied Jesus. When did it bother Peter that he, de he denied him three times without breaking a sweat? You know when it bothered him? When Jesus looked at him. Jesus didn't say a word. He just looked at him and Peter remembered that Jesus told him, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. That must have broke Peter's heart when that rooster started doing his cock a doodle do. The story could end right there. It did with Judas. Remember Judas sold Jesus out for money? Then he felt so guilty he threw the money back to the Pharisees. But Judas had bought a piece of land and he went out and he hung himself and sometime uh, after he had died from the hanging, he fell from that limb and his entrails burst forth onto the ground and, and he's in hell. How do I know he's in hell? Because Jesus said, woe to the man who betrays the Son of God. It would have been better if he would have never been born. Better if he would have never been born. There's not a special hell for Judas. He's going to the same one that Satan and his demons are going to, and he's going to the same one that you're going to if you don't know Jesus as your Savior. But thankfully, the story does not end there because we see that Jesus restores Peter. Boy, this ought to throw an amen up from someone. Jesus restored Peter. Jesus restored some of you. Yes, he did. So Jesus restores Peter, and we read about this in John chapter 21, verses 15 through 17. When they had eaten breakfast, can I tell you, we're going to have food in heaven? How many times does Scripture talk about Jesus eating? Oh yeah, we're going to be eating. But when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He's talking about the other apostles. Yes, Lord, he said to him, you know that I love you. Jesus knows everything. Jesus knows if you love him or not. He said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. He told him a second time, and he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, he said to him, you know that I love you. Shepherd my sheep, he told him. Now, you all know Peter up until now, loud mouth, impetuous, angry. You think he was starting to get his, his red in his neck up just a little bit over Jesus continuing to ask him the same question? He asked him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved. You could actually put in the word angered or perturbed or agitated that he asked him a third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep, Jesus said. Such simple remarks from the Savior. Not bow down and worship me. Not devote your life to me. Not give up all of your sins. Feed my sheep. 
Take care of the flock. Feed my lambs. Take care of those who I put you over. Do the right thing. See, being a witness to the resurrected Savior had a profound effect on Peter. Peter, who was angry, impetuous, loudmouthed, quick to act and not think, who looked out for his own hide when the trouble came down, this very same Peter became a totally different person when he had an encounter with the resurrected Christ. Jesus had been dead. He was, they witnessed His dead body. They knew that He was dead in the tomb. Now, for those people who think that the swoon theory could come into effect, you're not going to shove a spear in someone's side and have blood and water gush out and then three days later have them up walking around eating breakfast. Jesus died on that cross. Peter witnessed the resurrected Jesus Christ. And it changed him. It changed him so much that from then on, Peter proclaims Jesus. Impetuous Peter, who denied Christ three times. Now keep in mind, when we go to the book of Acts, and we'll be in Acts chapter 2 in just a few minutes, that the church was still under persecution, that the apostles had been warned not to preach Jesus Christ to the people. They had been told that it would end up bad for them if they continued to proclaim Jesus as a risen Savior or Messiah. And yet that didn't stop Peter. We go to the book of Acts chapter 2, verses 38 through 41, and we see what Peter says while he's preaching. Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. With many other words he testified and strongly urged them, saying, Be saved from this corrupt generation. So those who accepted his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 people were added to them. The very man that denied the Savior was responsible for 3,000 people hearing the word of God and coming to salvation. Peter goes on to preach to Gentiles and Jews and see a lot of people come to Christ. So we see that Jesus' words were actually prophetic when He said, On this rock I will build my church. Peter was instrumental in building the early church. Now, we will go into Paul at a later date, but today we're focusing on Peter. Imperfect Peter. Peter, who Jesus, who knows all things, could have took one look at him at the beginning and said, dude, you're not going to be worth the headache. But he didn't. He didn't. The man who misspoke, who rebuked Jesus, who acted impetuously, who cut off the ear of the high priest's servant, and even denying the, no, the one who would die for him. This very same Peter, who seemed to only look out for himself, went on to do great service for the Lord. After he had had an encounter with the risen Jesus, who commanded him to show his love by feeding his sheep. I want to ask you all a question. Would anybody in this room be willing to die a violent death for a myth? If you are, raise your hand. So there's not one human being in this room that would be willing to die for a myth. Well, this next question is going to be real difficult. I need to find 11 men that would be willing to die for a lie. Any takers? 
Because you see, the apostles did just that. The apostle Peter continued preaching the gospel until the authorities got a hold of him and they were going to crucify him. But Peter said, I'm not worthy to die in the same manner as my Savior. He was crucified upside down. That's how Peter died. Now, it's not in the Bible, that's not in the Scriptures, but there are writings from other eyewitnesses that attest to that. There's actually a book of Peter, not First and Second Peter, but a book of Peter that talks about this. Clement, one of the early church fathers, writes of the eyewitnesses seeing him being crucified upside down. The rest of the apostles met a similar fate. Some were beheaded, some were crucified, some were stabbed with swords, some were stoned to death. The only one who died a natural death is the Apostle John. But do you all know at one point in time he was immersed in boiling oil and somehow survived that? So 11 men were willing to give their lives. This isn't talking about the other Christians that met similar fates. I'm just talking about the 11 we read about in Scripture. They were willing to die because of the Savior, to bear witness to the power of Jesus Christ. And some of y'all in here today are going to deny Christ as Savior. When this man, these men, were willing to die for Him. You see, an encounter with the risen Savior is all it takes to change your life. You can go from a liar to to someone who's trustworthy. You can go from an addict to someone who's clean. You can go from someone who's addicted to pornography to someone that lives a pure and holy life. You can go from a denier of Christ to a lover of Christ once you have an encounter with the risen Savior. But Jesus isn't going to force Himself on anybody. I would defy anybody to find a Scripture that describes Jesus chasing down someone, saying, oh, please, 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 please come to church. Please, 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 please put your faith in me. Jesus doesn't need us. He wants us. But He's not going to force you to love Him or obey Him. He's going to ask you to. If you're here today and you're within the sound of my voice, guess what? Many are called, few are chosen. Today you are called. You have officially been called by God to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. Today you're called. What are you going to choose? It's up to you. Nobody else can make that choice for you. We've seen what happened to Peter. Jesus had every right to count Peter out. The reason Judas never got saved is because God knew Judas was not going to get saved. God knew no matter how much He called Judas or touched his heart or spoke to him, Judas was not going to put his faith in Jesus. Judas wanted the knight on the, uh, the white horse and shining armor to come through with his sword and defeat all the Romans so that the Jews could be free right then and there. He didn't care for this Savior that was going to save the world from its sins for eternity. He wanted His right now. Some of y'all want yours right now. You ain't going to get it right now. If you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, whatever you get right now is just a little bit of icing on the cake. Because you have eternal life in heaven with the Creator. But some of you will deny Jesus because you want what you want right now. Let me tell you, that extramarital affair is not worth your soul. That alcohol is not worth your soul. The drugs are not worth your soul. Your partying, good time, whatever it is, is not worth your soul. 
It's really not. Because Jesus promises to clean you up and make you a brand new human being when you come to faith in Him, when the Holy Spirit comes into you. Guys, I'm a walking, talking testimony of the change that Jesus Christ can do in a person's life when they allow the Holy Spirit to work in them. By all rights, God had every right to do away with me years ago. I was running from the Lord. I was living for myself. I was being selfish. I was seeking everything that the world told me would bring me comfort and joy. And I latched on to it and I ran with the devil for years and years and years. God had every right to look at me and say, Chris Woody, I'm done with you. You've denied me enough. But He didn't. I had my come to Jesus moment. When Jesus said, if you love me, you'll feed my sheep. When you, if you love me, you'll take care of my lambs. And there are times I've gotten exasperated at Jesus. Jesus, I'm trying to love some of these people, but they ain't taking it very well. And He says, you don't worry about how they take it. You keep on delivering. I'll take care of the rest. Folks, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, you're struggling with addiction, you're struggling with sin in your life, give it up to Jesus and let Him take care of the rest. Just like with Peter, once you have that moment with the risen Savior, and once you see the truth, you can't help but be a changed human being. And you will gladly proclaim Jesus when you're out in the public square. You won't worry about the persecution that comes. Some will say, that's one of them Jesus freaks right there. Yes, I am. That guy's a Bible thumper. He goes to church every Sunday. You better believe it. Because no matter what any man on this earth can do to you, is nothing compared to what Jesus has already done for you. But you need to put your faith in Him, and you need to do it now. Just like Peter urged the people he was preaching to, I'll go ahead and urge you today. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, you might not get another opportunity. This may be the last day you see on God's earth. When we walk out of this building, the, the, the clouds may part. We may hear a loud trumpet. And then everybody that's around you is going to be heading up and you're going to be standing there by yourself going, what in the world just happened? Because it's going to happen. I believe everything that God put in His Word. I've already given you evidence for why we can trust it. Why wouldn't we trust the rest of it? Scripture says that Jesus is coming back to take His church. Every prophecy that needs to be fulfilled for that to happen has already been fulfilled. The only thing we're waiting on is for God to finally have enough of humanity and say, all right, just like when Noah was around, I'm done with you guys. I ain't going to flood the earth, but I'm going to give you seven years of the worst time you've ever seen. You don't want to stick around for that. Trust me. But ultimately, the choice is yours. I can't make it for you. You have to decide to step out in faith. Ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior and then see what life is like on the other side of the new creation. Unless ye be born again, you will never see the kingdom of heaven. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're thankful that you have given us your word and your warnings. We're thankful, Lord, that you give us the accounts of people like Peter, of Samson, of David, Jonah, Lord, I could go on and on with names that You have given us in Your Word where You took imperfect people and You cleaned them up and used them for Your glory. Lord, I ask You right now that You clean up Your imperfect people. You clean up Your imperfect church. And Lord, that we will go on to do great things for Your honor and in Your name. Lord, forgive us when we make it about ourselves. But help us forever keep our eyes on Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith, the one who went to the cross of Calvary for the sins of the world. Lord, I pray for obedience from people today as the Holy Spirit touches them. Lord, may they not tarry and wait another day to seek salvation through the only name that man must be saved. 
And Father, we are thankful for that man that went to the cross. We're thankful for Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We're thankful for blood that was spilled so ours doesn't have to be. Lord, be with us now. Help us to be obedient to your calling. We pray all of this in the precious and heavenly name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Praise the Lord and hallelujah. As we stand and as we sing, the altar is open to any and all who will come to it. I'm available for prayer. If anybody uh, needs prayer, if you want to accept Christ as your Savior, how about share that with the church family so we can all rejoice with you? But don't leave out of here without making the most important decision you'll ever make in your life. What are we singing, brother? Number 322. Number 322 in the hymnals. You will it's need not going to be on the screens. Number 322. came to Jesus by night to ask him the way of salvation and light. The master made answer in words true and plain, he must be born again. He must be born again. I verily, verily say unto thee, he must be born again. Ye children of men, attend to the word so solemnly uttered by Jesus the Lord, and let not this message in you be in vain, he must be born again, he must be born again. I verily, verily say unto thee, ye must be born again. Oh, ye who would enter that glorious rest and to sing with the ransom. The song of the blessed, the life everlasting, if you would obtain, ye must be born again. Ye must be born again. Ye must be born. I verily, verily say unto thee, he must be born again. A dear one in heaven, thy heart yearns to see at the beautiful gate may be watching for thee and list to the note of this solemn refrain ye must be born again ye must be born again ye must be Oh,
Amen. Yesterday during our men's breakfast and devotion, um, you guys who weren't there, you really missed out on a great conversation. Amen. We had a really good meeting, great food, great conversation. But someone shared that they had shared with a co-worker about being born again. And I think it was Bruce. And the person looked at him and said, well, how can someone be born again? You can't go back to your mother's womb. And I said, well, this guy's name Nicodemus. <laughs> because those who don't know, don't know. And they don't understand and they don't get it. Folks, being reborn is not just a word we say as Christians. Right. It's something that happens in our life when we come to know Christ. You honestly, truly become a new creature in Amen. If you haven't experienced that, you're, I don't know what else to tell you. You're, you're missing out. So, that's enough preaching for one Sunday morning. We've got to do some polishing and done and coming up. So, I hope you all meet back with us tonight at 6 o'clock for our question and answer time. But right now, we get the distinct pleasure to be obedient to God in the ways of our tithes and our offerings. Now, if you're not tithing, let me tell you. God gives you everything you have. That's right. right. You can't outgive God. That's right. Amen. The more you give, the more you're going to get, the more He's going to bless you. If you're not tithing, that's another area I want to tell you. Step out in faith and see if God doesn't do some amazing things in your life. That's right. So I know we ask for a lot. There's a lot of things going on. You're going to be seeing some new construction going on here in the upcoming week with the sound booth and the platform and the choir rock, and you'll see where your money is going. We're doing things to honor God and hopefully make your worship experience one that will help draw people in. Folks, going out into the world, we're on their battleground, I'd much rather bring the fight into the church. Amen. Let's bring the lost in. Let's give them the word. So, with that being said, Deacon, if you would, please pray for this call tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for everyone here, Father. Father, as we come to this time of tithes and offerings, I ask that you bless these tithes and these offerings to further, to further your kingdom, Father. I just thank you for that. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Don't forget, tonight, 6 o'clock, we'll be meeting in the fellowship hall for a time of fellowship and, and ask the pastor any question that you may have. Um, as we go forward, looks like a beautiful day outside. If you'll notice, you can't see that through all the windows. Looks like someone's been hard at work in here. Brother Charles has been doing some work on the windows, putting the film up, and it looks beautiful. I really like that. I can't wait to see what it looks like when the rest of them are done. But I pray that our God who brings comfort and peace and joy and love will inhabit your homes. 
Why do I pray that? Because God doesn't force himself in your home. You have to invite him in. Make sure he's in there. I hope you all have a very restful afternoon. You'll come back tonight. We'll have a great time in the Lord tonight. Those of you who are planning on coming to the funeral tomorrow for Miss Doris Nettles, um, we're going to have a, a great time uh, remembering her and being thankful to the Lord that she knew Jesus. And she's in heaven right now. So I want to ask, I think Brother Drew is going to say our closing prayer, and then Brother Paul will lead us in our song of benediction. this day be with us father just be a blessing father for us let us be a blessing for others and father i just thank you for everything that's happened here today it's in your son jesus name i pray and all god's people say together amen, amen. Praise, praise the lord to you let's stand our song is number 447 trust and obey All right, we'll see y'all back here at 6 o'clock tonight.